Great, thank you. Uh, so I would like to introduce uh, Drav Batra, uh, who will be speaking today. Uh, he is an associate professor in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech and a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Uh, he is a recipient of several awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award uh, for Scientists and Engineers in just 2019, and has uh, several Best Paper Awards and nominations, including for 2017. Uh, so with that, I would like you to please start. Thank you, Keith. Um, um, and just checking again, people can, you can see my, my slides. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you for having me. Um, a large portion of this talk is new. I haven't given this before, so I'm, I'm excited for, uh, you, know, you can let me know how, the, how this goes. Um, I want to talk about uh, do blind AI navigation agents build maps? Um, and sort of more broadly, I am putting forth a hypothesis that we take embodiment seriously, uh, that embodiment is a pathway to intelligence. Um, and I guess from a practical perspective, uh, I'm presenting a tool called Habitat as well. So what is embodiment uh, hypothesis? Uh, for This is this idea from cognitive science and I encourage everyone to read this paper, but the embodiment hypothesis is the idea that intelligence emerges in the interaction of an agent with its environment and as a result of sensory motor activity uh, to the extent that humans uh, and human intelligence provides any sort of uh, uh, constructive proof or non-constructive proof or an existential proof that AI is possible, uh, we must also take seriously that we do not have any existence of a disembodied intelligent agent. We just have agents with bodies uh, that exist in environments um, and that we should take that idea seriously. Um, more specifically, uh, embodied AI is the study of uh, agents acting in environments or agents with physical or virtual embodiment. Um, and there has been a growing shift in, in machine learning, I'd say um, from, you know, learning on static data sets of images or text downloaded from, download from the web to the study of agents acting in environments. Uh, these agents may be physical, in which case this is the entire field of robotics, um, physical agents taking physical actions in the world, talking to humans in natural language, or these agents may be virtual. Um, so imagine you are wearing you know, in not so distant future, smart glasses that have AR capabilities where an agent can perceive what you are perceiving because you're wearing these smart glasses and you can talk to this agent to ask questions like, where did I leave my keys? And the agent can give you answers. Um, this is also an embodied intelligence. The body is yours, uh, but the problems are the same of egocentric per perception, episodic memory, environmental representations, um, and then ultimately grounded language. Um, the common theme here, as I said, is of course embodiment. Uh, the common problems is the, are um, that either the ideal hardware doesn't exist in some cases, um, and training and testing in reality is slow, dangerous, expensive, and you know, from a scientific perspective, most problematically not easily reproducible. Um, a somewhat dirty secret of robotics research is that robotic capabilities in academic labs die every time a PhD student graduates. Uh, that there are certain people associated with certain robots that can get some things to be done and that there is no replicability even within the same lab, let, us, let aside uh, outside certain labs. Um, so we'd like to change that. Uh, and one uh, sort of uh, paradigm that has emerged, not just from us, but others uh, in the research community as well, is to pre-train in simulation, to use simulation as, uh, as a way to scale and then deploy whatever you learned in simulation to real hardware. Um, and in that spirit, um, for the last three years or so, uh, a multi-institution group of us um, at FAIR, at Georgia Tech, uh, collaborators at Intel, Berkeley, uh, Simon Fraser University and, and others have been working on a simulation platform called Habitat. Um, our goal is to create the ImageNet, the COCO, the VQA of embodied AI, meaning what is the right data set? What is the right simulator? What is the right task? What is a benchmark that we can, that we can rally around um, to, to study the problems that we wanna study? Um, we think of the software stack, if you will, or the conceptual stack of uh, embodied AI at three levels. Like there are 
3D assets at the bottom, there are simulation capabilities in the middle, and there are tasks at the top. Um, in disembodied AI, typically the middle layer is missing. You still have to define a task and a, and a data set to study it. There's a middle layer here that has been added. Um, and so I'll, let me give you a quick tour of what types of things we work with. Um, at the very bottom level are 3D assets that you situate an agent in. Um, and the Habitat supports a large number of uh, scans of indoor environments. Uh, these are the popular ones. These are data sets that already exist in the world. Um, Madipo 3D is one, ScanNet is one, Gibson is another, and Replica is something that uh, my collaborators at FAIR uh, released. Um, this right here is a scan from the Replica data set. And I want you to notice that this is the state of the art in 3D reconstruction technology. This is where we are as a community. We can take in uh, sensors, we can go to a space and we can reconstruct it and then texture map it and then relight it um, so that we can get really, really high quality reconstructions and renderings from these 3D spaces. This is, this is where simulation is in terms of rendering. Um, this is just, of course, uh, one space. Here's another, we have multi-story houses in there. You can see the quality of the geometry in these reconstructions, it's not perfect thin edges and structures are missing. Uh, there are semantic annotations in 3D, which means you can render semantic segmentation, surface normals, whatever you'd like from arbitrary views and use that for training. Um, Habitat, by the way, also supports just bringing your own data. Um, so this is a $3,000 um, RGBD camera from a company called Matterport. You place it at various uh, locations. It spins around, takes a panoramic uh, 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 image, then it creates a 3D reconstruction of that space that can be loaded up in simulation. Uh, this is really, as a community, we should be proud. This is the uh, maturing of, uh, of a technology that is now just a commercial service. It's available uh, for not too expensive a price. Um, in terms of the simulator capabilities, um, we have of course been studying sort of navigation and rendering type tasks. So we can insert an, a, a robot in these, in these scans. We can render egocentric RGB in depth. Um, we have been, uh, we've integrated this with uh, rigid body physics. So Habitat has, uh, has an integration with bullet physics engine. So you can insert objects, you can apply forces, you can simulate gravity, you can simulate collisions. Um, and there are full interactive robots. Um, so this is a fetch robot in simulation of an indoor space, picking an object, opening uh, cabinets, putting an object in cabinets, um, you know, throwing objects around uh, on the floor, putting things in the sink, opening a refrigerator, taking things out of the refrigerator and so on. So these are the sort of capabilities that, that already exist uh, in, in, in the simulation platform. Um, one thing I want to quickly mention before I, I dive into research is why did we build a simulator ourselves? Uh, why, why go around doing this? Um, and the reason is, is that the common way people from an engineering perspective build simulators is that they start with video game engines, Unity, Unreal engines, then they stack a, stick around a wrapper around it to make it accessible to research, typically a Python wrapper. Uh, and then they use PyTorch or TensorFlow for training. And this is a fairly common sort of design paradigm uh, of these systems. You do that and you end up with systems that can operate at 10 to 60 FPS or frames per second. So every time a robot takes an action, it will get a response back. And the rate of that response is roughly uh, 10 to 60 frames per second. Um, that reason, the reason why this is uh, at, the, at this rate is because really there is a dichotomy between uh, there's a fairly heavy drift between human needs and AI needs. Video game engines are meant for human consumption. A, a human is going to sit at a, at a monitor and they're going to consume just RGB. Uh, they're going to want it at high uh, pixel resolution. Uh, 1080p is you know, barely accept acceptable. People are asking for 4K now. Um, but we're just going to ask, humans are just going to ask for this at 60 hertz. Um, most humans will not notice any difference if it's anything greater than 60 Hertz. If it's VR, sometimes you need up to 90 Hertz, but you never need anything more than that. AI needs and machine needs are almost entirely opposite. Uh, we're not going to have any monitor. It's going to run distributed headless on a cluster. 
we're not just going to ask for RGB, we're going to ask for depth rendering, surface normals, audio, GPS, LIDAR, radar. There's going to be multimodal information that the AI system is going to consume. Turns out the AI systems don't actually need high pixel resolution. It's just going to get shoved into a CNN anyway. Low resolution is fine. Uh, what we do really care about is high throughput, high frame rate. Um, we are going to ask for thousands of hertz or thousands of frames per second. And the reason why we're going to ask that is because this simulation speed directly will correspond to our training speed. And so the sort of key engineering contribution of Habitat is that it's over 50x faster than anything else on the market. Um, these are a few different comparisons of simulators uh, that existed, that have existed in the last couple of years. There are some new ones uh, that are not on this slide, but we're still significantly faster than anything that's available. Um, a single instance of Habitat runs at a few thousand frames per second. And because we own the simulation stack on a single GPU, we can pack in multiple instances and get over 10,000 frames per second. Um, and 10,000 frames per second is, it really matters like this. It, it directly translates to uh, training speeds. Um, and this, the reason why simulation speed matters is because you can now run experiments that you couldn't before. And I will show you this exactly in the rest of my talk that I couldn't have run those experiments if we didn't have access to this, this engineering contribution. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that there is a simulation action loop um, that the agent takes actions, the simulator returns and observations. And so the faster that the simulator can return those observations, the faster the agent can take those actions and this loop runs faster. And so you can scale your, your learning paradigms up. Okay, so that was just a quick sort of intro to the sort of systems or the, or the context of the engineering uh, that we've done. Um, I wanna talk about two key pieces of research in this talk. Uh, one is, uh, you know, training agents to navigate with vision, so sighted agents. Uh, this is building off of work that we presented last year at, uh, at iClear. Um, and the second is the title of my talk, which is training agents to navigate without vision. Um, and we'll, we'll get through them. So I'll, before I get started, I'll, I'll pause here if there are any questions so far about what I've said. And for those of you who want to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand by pressing the reactions button uh, and the raise hand button within that tab. I, I should mention that I can't actually see any of those reactions, so somebody will have to just oh, tell me. Yeah, for sure. I'll tell you uh, and no one's raised their hand. Sounds good. So I'll, I'll continue on. So let's talk about the first piece of work, uh, which is uh, DDPPO. Uh, this was work done by these set of collaborators. Uh, it's work led by Eric Wymans, who is a PhD student at Georgia Tech. Uh, so uh, the question that we asked in this work is how far can we scale model-free reinforcement learning? Uh, apologies for introducing an acronym, RL, without describing it. Model-free reinforcement learning for embodied visual navigation. That's the question. What I'll do is I'll parse every phrase in there to explain what, we, what I mean by that question. So what do I specifically mean about embodied visual navigation? The, the task that I am studying in this, in this work is something called point goal navigation. Um, you have a virtual agent or a virtual robot. Uh, it, is, uh, it is spawned randomly somewhere in a 3D environment in a house. Uh, it is asked to go to a particular point coordinate uh, an X, Y, Z coordinate in this, in this space. The top-down map is for visualization only. The agent does not have access to the top-down map. Uh, the agent has never seen this environment before. If the map was available, then this is a sort of CS 101 homework assignment problem. This is just a path planning problem in 2D spaces. This is as trivial as, as it gets. This is, this is at the level of a homework problem. If the map is not available, this was an open research question. We just do not know how to do this from raw observations, or at least you know we know how to do it. It's not clear uh, whether we found the best way or not. Um, the sensors on the robot 
is that the robot has a depth sensor, an egocentric depth sensor. So imagine a Kinect uh, uh, Intel RealSense camera that's giving you egocentric depth. Uh, there's an egocentric RGBD sensor um, and a localization sensor. You can imagine this is an ego motion sensor on wheeled robots, or you can imagine this is a GPS and compass sensor. This precise details don't matter. What, uh, what just matters is the robot knows how far it has traveled from its start location. Therefore, it knows where the goal is where it, with respect to where it is uh, at any given point of time. Um, and so this is what the robot is expected to do. Um, it just sees these three sensor readings and it is expected to start, go to the end. Uh, if it gets to the end within 0.2 meters of the, of the point, it is considered a successful episode. And then we also measure path efficiency. So the green line was the shortest path. The blue line is the agent travel path. We can compare the shortest to the blue line and tell what is the efficiency of this path. Notice that the green line knows the map. It's shortest path under the map. The blue line includes any, of, any exploration that may need to be done. So it's a pretty harsh metric if you, you're being judged against something that has Oracle information. So that's the task. Uh, now, if you're a roboticist, at this point, you say, well, we know how to solve this problem. Uh, the classical robotics pipeline for solving this problem is that there are three problems here. There is a mapping component, there's a localization component, and there's a planning component. Uh, we, we know the data structures. You build a map. You know where you are on the map. There's a localization sensor anyway. You have ego motion, so you, you register yourself according to the map, and you do path planning, A star, or whatever is your favorite uh, planning algorithm. What we're going to do is none of that. We are not going to assume anything about the problem domain. And we are going to uh, follow what is known as just extreme model-free reinforcement learning. Um, we're going to construct uh, an architecture that almost has nothing to do with navigation. Um, so the agent at every point of time receives an image. It's an RGBD uh, tensor. Where and it has a goal sensor, right? It knows where the goal is relative to itself. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to encode the image through a CNN. This is a ResNet in this case. Um, and we're going to encode the goal sensor through some embedding layers. Uh, there's going to be a policy, which is a RNN, a recurrent neural network, in this case, an LSTM. You can tell that this work was done a couple of years ago if we were doing it now, or, or a year and a half ago, if we were doing this now, we, you would see the mention of transformers here. That's not relevant. What's relevant is that these are generic task agnostic components, a CNN and an RNN. And uh, uh, the RNN at every timestamp is going to produce an action, turn left, turn right, move forward, and a value estimate. And that's it. We're just going to unroll this RNN and that's our architecture. I should pause and mention, by the way, that you know these pieces have nothing to do with navigation. This may as well have been an image captioning uh, or a video captioning architecture that uh, this could be a could have been a video and this could have been description tokens from a vocabulary of English words uh, as opposed to action uh, discrete tokens. So this has nothing to do with navigation. Uh, the only place where it has anything to do with navigation is in where how we write down the reward function. And our reward function is uh, fairly uh, fairly straightforward. Um, at any point of time, the robot takes an action. Uh, what we are going to do is we're going to look at uh, between time t and t minus one, did you reduce or increase the distance to the goal? Uh, this is a shaped reward. Uh, so if you go closer to the goal, you get a positive reward. If you get, because if you go closer to the goal, then the distance has gone down. And so the reward is positive. If you go far away from the goal, then the distance has gone up and the reward is negative. If you reach the goal, there is some fixed uh, successful positive uh, terminal reward. And at every given point of time, you just get bumped on your head. Uh, you just get a negative penalty at every given point of time to encourage efficiency. The, this is the only place where any of this has anything to do with navigation at all, that there is a shaped reward that's encouraging you to navigate. And in some sense, I, I, I feel like I'm belaboring this, this point, but I, I want to say there's a, there's a sense of radical empiricism here. Um, in the following sense, uh, I want to list down all the things that we are not doing that we could have done and that you do see in uh, papers studying the, these sort of tasks. So first of all, there are no task specific modules. There is nothing navigation specific. There's no slam happening. 
there's no explicit mapping happening. There's no path planning happening. Uh, none of the classical uh, ways of solving this problem. Uh, there are no do domain specific inductive biases in the architecture, right? There's no spatial memory. Uh, our architecture does not know, our agent does not know this is a 2D navigation problem or a 3D navigation problem. It does not have any knowledge of projective geometry. It does not have any knowledge of 3D. As far as it's, it's concerned, it receives tensors, four dimensional RGBD tensors, and it just uh, encodes them through convolutions. Uh, it doesn't even know that the data is spatial. Um, there's no additional learning signal of any kind. There's no mapping supervision. There's no auxiliary tasks. Um, there's no expert demonstration. Uh, no human or an oracle ever shows it a shortest path. Uh, there's no pre-training of any representations. There's no imaginative pre-training of the CNN or the or anything of the RNN. Uh, all components are initialized from scratch. There's no look ahead or search trees. Um, uh, there's there's and using that to do temporal difference learning. There's none of that. Uh, there's really no learning tricks at all. There's no curriculum here. There's no replay buffer. Um, there's no offline storing of certain good states to be at and then restarting from partially successful states. There is just on policy, episodic reinforcement learning. You are spawned, you act, you suffer the consequences of your actions and you try to do better the next time you are spawned. That's it. Um, and the only sort of trick you can you can hold us accountable for is that there are dense rewards that uh, that we we are doing reward shape. Um, I want to mention that the reason we are taking sort of this extreme stand is not because we are arguing that this is the right way to solve this problem, but because this is an extreme stand that will expose what is learnable. Can you learn this problem in even without assuming anything else? Um, so it's really just a existence proof type of uh, uh, type of question. Um, and so that's that's where we're going with. Um, and we'd like to see after you do all of this, what emerges? What do we learn? What's possible? So the next part of that uh, that question is how far can we scale this? Um, because it's clear if you don't make any assumptions, you're going to need to scale. So this is where uh, the title of that paper comes in. This is, we presented uh, an algorithm called uh, decentralized distributed proximal policy optimization. Proximal policy optimization or PPO was an existing algorithm uh, for on policy reinforcement learning. We made it decentralized and distributed, meaning that we uh, run simulation on multiple GPUs that are both altern that are all alternating between collecting experience, meaning the agent is acting in this in these simulations running on multiple GPUs, and synchronizing gradients. Uh, this is a fairly simple synchronous technique. There is no asynchronicity here. There is there are no stale gradients. Nothing ever goes out of sync. Uh, this lets us we find that this actually scales quite well, uh, and this lets us uh, scale to a large number of, uh, of GPUs. Actually, I had hidden those slides, but I think I'm doing fine on time, so I can, I can show you these. Um, we actually find fairly nice scaling. We can, uh, so the straight line would be linear scaling, and we actually find that with 250, 256 GPUs, we can scale this uh, nearly 200 times uh, compared to a, uh, a single GPU baseline of, uh, of training these things. So we can actually, not only is our simulator a couple of orders of magnitude faster, but we can throw a GPU cluster of 256 GPUs at the crop and get you know, another two orders of magnitude speed up uh, there. So we can scale it. We want to solve uh, embodied visual navigation. We're going to make no assumption. The you know now's the time for the rubber to meet the road. How far can we scale it? Like, does this work? Um, and this is our key quantitative result. Um, on the x-axis, I want you to notice our amounts of uh, steps of experience. So every time the agent takes an action, it gets a frame and a reward at that action. And so this is in log scale, it's going 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine. Uh, we are scaling it out to 2.5 billion 
steps of experience. Um, if you converted, if you looked at the velocity of this robot and converted this into a real experiment on a robot, this would take roughly 80 years uh, for this robot uh, to just be running uh, and gathering this much data. Um, this ran, um, and so these are the, this is success, uh, success on new environments. This is not training performance. This is success on new environments that it has never seen before as a function of the experience of the training experience. Um, what we notice is that success basically goes to uh, near perfect. We get, we're getting 99.9% uh, .9 success. Uh, we used 180 uh, GPU days, uh, and this was done in 64 GPUs. So this is done in three wall clock days. So in three days of wall clock time, uh, six months of GPU training time, we can get this uh, you know, near perfect result, 99.9% .9 success, um, which means the navigation is you know, out of 1,000 episodes we're like failing once. Uh, these are new environments. And even the path efficiencies are in high 90s. Uh, so there's like 96% path efficiency, meaning that in unseen environments without ever constructing a map, an agent is taking is getting within four percent of the shortest path that it could travel in these in, in these environments without having access to a map, um, and I think that is uh, in new environments a phenomenal result. So this is, for example, what it looks like. The agent is spawned here. Um, it basically travels outside the door, end of the hallway, turns right, reaches uh, the goal. Um, you know, this kind of looks like the shortest path. This is about as close. If you had drawn a shortest path on this on this map, this is what you would have drawn. Uh, the agent has, you know, is not doing any sort of exploration above or below. Here's another environment. This is a bit more challenging environment. The agent has spawned here. Notice it does not have access to the map. There is a room it's in. There's a doorway. There's another doorway. There's a hallway here. Uh, there is a. This is the goal that it's trying to reach. Actually, let me see if I can switch to something a bit more. Uh, yeah, laser board. Okay, so this is where the agent is trying to reach. There's a bunch of doors and hallways it has to go through. Um, I will turn this on and you'll see that the, the agent just sort of turns around, exits out one doorway, another doorway, down the hall, and turns to reach the goal. Uh, notice that it doesn't travel up here. It doesn't uh, try, take this left turn. Uh, maybe there was a pathway through here. Um, here's an interesting example that we found uh, where on the right is again the top down map. It's a much larger house. Um, this is the uh, goal uh, representation, the, the GPS goal representation. What I will do is I will start this and I'll pause this video at a particular time. Uh, the green is the shortest path. Uh, so incidentally, our agent does not travel the shortest path. It actually overshoots, goes to the right. And I'll, I'll show you this in a second. So it goes to the, goes straight. And at this point, the agent uh, agent's goal sensor uh, is telling it that, that the target is exactly dead right ahead of it. Um, there are a few options that the agent can do. It can go straight and, you know, go straight, turn right and turn left at the fork at, that's coming in the room. Um, the goal sensor is telling, telling it that the, that the goal is dead on straight ahead uh, to where the agent is looking. Um, the RGB and the depth sensors are telling you that there is a, there's a blockage up ahead. Uh, the agent can see that. Um, and on the left is a wall that's continuing as well. So you'll see this agent sort of smoothly just sort of turn right at that fork, not even evaluate any other options. Um, and if I hadn't paused this, I think you would have just missed that this was uh, even a fork in the road. Um, and it sort of goes right down the hallway, enters into a door, enters into a, this bathroom and reaches the, the goal. Um, we also find the emergence of backtracking behavior. Um, so here's an agent. Um, and at this point, it has basically overshot. It was supposed to go to this goal location. Uh, it requires entering this doorway, uh, but it's, it's basically overshot uh, its entry into the doorway. So it makes a mistake. Um, it goes down the hallway. And at that point, the depth sensor is telling it that there's no way in, there's no way left. Uh, and so you'll see it essentially backtrack, go all the way back um, and enter back into that, uh, that door uh, into, into the point. And there's no planning here. There are no search trees. Uh, so this is 
this is emergent behavior uh, of a system that has memory uh, and therefore can, can do this sort of backtrack. So the answer to the question I asked, how far can we scale model-free reinforcement learning for embodied visual navigation? Uh, the answer is surprisingly far. Um, I don't think people would have guessed this. We were very surprised. We run an annual competition on this task. Um, and you know, in 2019, uh, we were very far away from 100% success. We solved this, this problem. So, but the, I want to be careful that the assumptions we're making is that there is a depth sensor and there is a localization sensor. Uh, you need to know how far you have traveled. And that seems to be a particularly important sensor. Um, if you take away the localization sensor, if you don't have that uh, ego motion or GPS and compass sensor, then in 2020, uh, the best performing method was a 10% success. This year, we're seeing methods quickly have jumped to 70% success. So we're not far enough yet with large scale model free reinforcement learning, but it's quickly improving. Uh, and if you just change the goal specification, instead of giving uh, X, Y, Z coordinate of the target, if you just give a name of an object, and so you have to recognize that object, uh, that was hopeless in 2020. Uh, we have made progress. Uh, so this year, the best performing methods are at 35% success, but clearly there's a, there's a long way to go. So I'll pause there uh, to see if there are any questions. Um, and after this, I'll head into the, the blind navigation and stuff. As before, please feel free to raise your hand. And uh, we have no one raising their hand, so I, you can continue. Sounds good. Okay, so the hopefully the first half of this talk, um, I've at least convinced you a little bit that if we scale learning, interesting phenomena emerges and that we can navigate. Uh, in the next part of this talk, um, this is again a project that is led by uh, Eric Wymans. Uh, he's been doing a lot of this simulation and, and navigation work. Uh, this is in collaboration with uh, folks at Simon Fraser, Oregon State, uh, and FAIR, of course. Um, we wanted to test the cognitive map hypothesis. So the cognitive map hypothesis is this idea in cognitive science. Um, it's this hypothesis that uh, brains of organisms build internal spatial representations of the environment that the organisms use to navigate. Um, it's this idea that you are not just a reactive sensory motor system, that you have, if I, if I take you to a new city and you explore around, um, you are able to, after a while, uh, have some spatial arrangement of where different buildings are with respect to each other. You are able to maybe point to where, uh, if I turned you around, you're able to point to where a building is. You were able to maybe take shortcuts. Um, uh, I show you a long route and maybe you're able to take a shortcut the next time because you have realized that on the map, there's a shorter path. That map never explicitly exists except in your head. Um, this idea comes from uh, Edward Tolman's work in 1948. Uh, this is considered a classic in the history of uh, psychology. Uh, he presented this uh, perhaps overly gendered title, but uh, this, this paper called Cognitive Maps in Rats and Men. Um, and he presented this experiment uh, in it where um, he took uh, uh, rats, uh, I, I'm blanking out on exactly what kind, but he trained them uh, in this uh, initially uh, apparatus where they were always released at A. Um, there was only one place for them to go. The food is located at, at this location, G. Um, and so they learn uh, to go through this passageway uh, and then are rewarded by food here. Um, so they get they experience this very quickly and they are, they're able to, uh, when released in this, always find their way very quickly to the food. Um, after they were performing successful at this task, uh, he changed the apparatus um, so that now that pathway uh, is blocked. Um, instead, they are presented with a sequence of options uh, of tubes going out in various directions. Um, if these organisms are purely doing sensory motor adaptation in the sense that they are simply memorizing what actions to take in this environment in order to maximize their chances of getting food, they would go down here uh, and then not know what to do. Um, however, 
in these cases, uh, G is where the food is. And so they end up taking this route, which takes them to the food. And this was his uh, sort of, his experiment testing that there, there is a map that they're building in their head, which tells them that what is the location of the food relative to themselves right now, even though they have never traveled uh, down any of these tubes. Um, and this has been um, a sort of controversial uh, idea over the years because there have been arguments uh, because there are other competing mechanisms that might explain. Uh, so the phenomena is, is fairly repeatable. Uh, a wide variety of animals exhibit uh, this sort of behavior. Uh, ants to bats to blind mole rats uh, and chimpanzees. Uh, the, the slight controversy that occurs is that it's typically fairly difficult to rule out any other uh, mechanisms that may be explaining this phenomena. So in bats, for example, you have to rule out echolocalization um, in, in this environment, and that's often not, uh, not easy. So we wanted to ask this question, is there evidence for cognitive, is there evidence for the cognitive map hypothesis in machines? Uh, and more specifically, do AI agents build mental maps? I just showed you navigation agents that did very well at navigation. Are they building mental maps? Um, and why should we care about this question? I think for one, it would shed um, light on the inner workings uh, of an otherwise perhaps not so uh, scrutable uh, navigation system. But I think more importantly, I'm fascinated by this idea of uh, convergent evolution. Uh, convergent evolution is this idea of unrelated organisms evolving structures that have the same function. Um, so the evolution of the wing has happened in three completely different uh, evolutionary branches. Um, so bats have wings, uh, pterodactyls had wings, and uh, birds have wings. Uh, however, one of them has an ancestral bird, the other is a reptile, the other is a mammal. If you trace them to their common ancestor, that common ancestor does not fly. Um, and so the the evolution of wings in completely disconnected or otherwise distant uh, families of, of species tells us something about the problem that you're trying to solve. It tells us something about wings being an essential component to flight. Uh, it tells us not about this organism, but about the problem. Um, and this has happened over and over again. There are other examples, like the emergence of poison as a defense mechanism. Um, echolocalization has happened in multiple species, streamlined shapes uh, for swimming. Um, photosynthesis has actually uh, been, been involved in a bunch of different lines. And that tells us something about that problem. And so my argument is, if we find evidence for cognitive maps in, in artificial systems, that tells us that there's something about maps that are a natural solution to the problem of navigation, whether the agent navigating is biological or artificial. Um, and so that I think is, is, a, is a deeper question um, and that's why we should, we should care. So we're going to do the same thing. The problem that we're going to solve is the same point goal navigation problem. Uh, the agent is still spawned in these environments, asked to go to a target, except this is going to be extreme navigation, extreme point call navigation. There is no depth sensor. There is no vision sensor. These agents are going to operate purely based on a localization sensor. They know how far they are traveling every time they take an action and they know where the goal is. Um, and that's it. That's the only sensor available. Um, this matches the sensory apparatus roughly uh, or is, is perhaps a course model for blind mole rats. Um, if you're underground, you don't have a sense of smell, you're not uh, watching, it, you're not seeing anything. And so it's just uh, ego motion. If you have access to ego motion, you know where you want to go. That's what the, the sensor is. And this is what an episode might look like. You don't see a map, you don't see anything around you. All you see is this red dot uh, at you know, r comma theta is about where you want to get to. So that's the sensory apparatus. Um, the beauty of not making any assumptions is making fewer assumptions is, is trivial, uh, not making many assumptions. Uh, so a general architecture, you just, instead of this vision uh, model, just block it out. There is no sensor, uh, there is no visual sensor. So our architecture is exactly the same, except all we have access to is this goal uh, pointer that's going into our policy. Um, so our only sensing, recap again, is ego motion. 
Therefore, we can rule out that this navigation agent cannot possibly be using visual landmarks. It cannot recognize where it has reached because it does not see. Uh, there, there are no other sensors like olfactory gradients or anything. So it renders a whole bunch of mechanisms to explain biological navigation infeasible. Um, and again, there's no inductive bias towards mapping, right? There, these are generic components in our architecture. There's no mapping supervision. There's no spatial memory. There's no auxiliary tasks. So if maps emerge in such an extreme scenario, it tells us something about, about maps. So let's start with the first question. Can blind agents navigate? Is that even possible? Uh, and the answer right off the bat is yes. It's, they can navigate actually very well, uh, just not very efficiently. They are very effective, they're just not very efficient. Um, and so this is a plot where on the x-axis is again, steps of experience. Uh, this is going on to just 1.5 billion steps of experience. The dotted line are uh, sighted agents and the solid line are the blind agents. The green is success and the uh, blue or black is, uh, is path efficiency or SPL. And so the blind agents are also re reaching high 90% success. They are just not very efficient. They're very far away. Um, and you can see this in, in videos. So this is that same episode I showed you of a sighted agent, which this episode had completed in what looked like a near shortest path. This is what a blind agent does. It slams its face against the wall and basically just does wall following. And this is the emergence of a behavior. Nothing changed from our learning algorithm perspective. We just turned the sensor off and then retrained. And we are not encouraging any sort of wall following as a, as a signal. It just figures out that it's, it's not moving much based on the difference in the, in the goal, uh, that the goal is not moving much. And this is a phenomenon that just emerges. It, it's now automatically hugging and following walls. This is another environment where this is a sighted agent. I showed you this agent before. It turns around and like a straight line path follows it out the doorways and the hallways and reaches the goal. Um, this is a blind agent in the same environment um, and it, it's exhibiting the same behavior of wall following, of uh, you know trying to go towards a direction, getting stuck and then following along a wall um, and making incremental progress along the way. So you'll see that it's, it you know, doesn't give up. It's sort of like, it's hard to not anthropomorphize this uh, and call this uh, sort of resilient, uh, but it just sort of keeps following uh, directions uh, uh, towards the goal. And ultimately this will succeed. Uh, oh, the video hung. You can trust me that it, it succeeds. It gets there. It heads back in here and does wall following. If, if I may briefly interrupt, I was curious why it didn't try to follow the shortest or why it didn't try to go in the direction of the object itself. So I was seeing in the first video, it was going the opposite direction of, of the of the goal uh, when it was, yeah, in that, in that video or in this video, it wasn't necessarily trying to say, all right, how do I get to the to the to the goal at hand? So it seems to be learning that maybe because of the complexity of this house. Uh, it doesn't need to go the shortest, most obvious path. Uh, is yes. there some intuition for that? Yes, thank you. That's an excellent question. So uh, a couple of observations. Uh, the initial heading is randomized. Um, it does not always get initialized in the same way. And so uh, it could, for example, learn to just turn till the goal is in front of it. But we found that what it likes doing is first finding the closest wall and then following the wall around. Um, and this is just a qualitative uh, sense that we have. Uh, so in this case, for example, let me see if I can play this. Uh, yeah, so it's trying to find a wall and then, uh, and then following that wall around. Um, I haven't quantified this behavior of how often it first turns versus not, but that's a, that's a good observation. I think it's, it's, it's exploiting the characteristics of indoor environments, that there are walls, walls continue, that there are corridors. And so if you can find them, you can follow them. Does that at least uh, give you a sense of intuition? Yes, it, it, it helps a lot. Although um, I'm, I'm also trying to figure out how this relates per se to mental maps. Although I, I think you'll probably explain mm -hmm. in a moment. Yeah, not yet. So uh, yeah, we'll get that. 
So, so far, I'm just telling you blind agents can navigate. Uh, they can navigate very well and that we're finding the emergence of the bug algorithm behavior. So bug algorithms are this family of algorithms that started all the way from uh, Vladimir Lubezki's work uh, in you know, 1987, but he proposed, so he was, you know, he was taking a fairly mathematical view that if you have a point mass robot uh, that just, have a, just has access to its localization sensor and a tactile sensor telling it when it's in touch with an, with an obstacle, and if you have, arbitrary piecewise polygonal uh, 2D shapes. Um, he basically proved that you can always navigate from point A to point B uh, using these sort of uh, what he called bug algorithms. Uh, and he actually even provided lower bounds on how uh, how bad this algorithm could be. Um, and it, you basically had to figure out when you when you came in contact with an obstacle, do you want it to follow it left or right? Um, that, and you basically come up with heuristics. Um, and so we're finding the emergence of that behavior uh, without any sort of encoding of that behavior. Um, and in fact, we tested against bug algorithms, not just any bug algorithm, a clairvoyant bug algorithm. So a, clair, a clairvoyant so bug algorithm basically has to make a choice. When you come in contact with an obstacle, do you follow it left or right? And what we said was, what if we give you Oracle performance? What if we tell you that the right one is left, like the correct choice is right or left? Even if you do that, bug algorithms are only 46% path efficient. The blind RL agents are significantly more path efficient than that. They're making inferences. They're not just, they're cutting smartly between obstacles, uh, they're not just going in the straight line from the start to the end. Um, and that was an interesting uh, phenomenon. Um, so the key question that you have to ask is, okay, blind agents can navigate. Well, what mechanism do they use? Um, with the next thing we said was, okay, we're using this policy that has history, that has you know, long amounts of memory. What if we chop off the memory length? What if we say that you're only allowed to remember the last 10 or 100 or 1,000 steps. And we find that the performance doesn't saturate till 1,000. Uh, if, if the agent only remembers its current action, meaning it's completely reactive, then it's, it's, it's really poor. It does not perform, it does not succeed at all, um, or it, it's not path efficient at all. Uh, but if, it, if you give it the last 10, the last 100, the last 1,000, then that's when it reaches peak performance. So clearly it's remembering what it did a long time ago because that helps it not fall into the trap of exploring the same region over and over again. It is not repeating itself because it remembers. So memory is key. Um, then you can ask, well, what information does the memory encode? Um, and here we uh, performed a AI rendition of a rendition of Menzel's uh, experiments with chimpanzees. So this was a classical study done where you take chimpanzees to a few different locations, uh, one of which contains food, uh, but you don't take them directly to the food. Uh, they build, the reason why we believe chimpanzees build mental maps is because when you leave them alone in the same environment and give them control, they go directly to the food. They do not follow the path that you showed. And so we're going to do that same thing here we're going to initialize this agent at some start location. It is going to do a whole bunch of exploration uh, and it is going to reach its target. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do a second navigation study. We're going to initialize a second agent at the same start or at the target, doesn't really matter, at one of these locations, but we're going to endow this second agent with the memory of the first agent. Uh, and this is fairly easy for us to do. Uh, and we'll see whether it, uh, takes shortcuts, whether it doesn't explore in the same way that the first agent explored. So if it doesn't explore this room, it means that it remembers a spatial representation that's allowing it to take shortcuts. Um, the the, the, how we can do this is you just run the first agent out, you take its final LSTM state, and you initialize the second agent with this LSTM state. So the, which cutting, pasting memory vectors. Um, and this is what happens. So this is the first agent. This is trying to find its way from the source to the target. You notice the same wall following behavior that I've been talking about the entire time goes into uh, you know, these excursions of rooms that don't lead out anywhere. When it reaches the target, I'm going to initialize the second agent with the memory of the first agent. And in this video, it's going to be S to T and the second nav from T to S. So it's going to be the return journey that I want you to pay attention to. Now notice what happens on the return journey. 
notice how straighter this path is. There is very little wall following. There's a, there's a little bit of wall following, but there's no, there's no exploration. There are no side rooms being explored. On its way back, it seems to know where it's going. And this is a phenomenon we've seen over and over again. Here's another video where it's going from you know, wall following uh, from source to target. You'll see it get stuck, come back, get stuck at this end, go back again, explore this room. Notice it's not getting stuck in loops. It doesn't keep going left, right, left, right. It makes progress. And think how much of a struggle this was and watch what it does on its way back. What, see how shorter that path is. I almost sort of challenge you to look at these and tell me that there's not a map here. Tell me that this thing doesn't know in its head that there are obstacles. And again, this is a blind agent. On its way back, it cuts through spaces that it cannot see. Uh, all it does has is localization sensor. So it's the same thing. This agent will struggle, wall follow, explore one end, explore another end. It's essentially going to draw out sort of a perimeter by following this wall. ultimately find its way down a hallway, find its way to the target, and then I want you to notice what it does on its way back. It is a lot straighter. It is still colliding. It does do some wall following, but there are no excursions. It, it is not retracing its steps because if it was retracing its steps, then it would have done all the things on its way there. On its way back, it's a lot faster. And we've quantified this. Turns out that on its way back, the path efficiency goes up by 14%. This is, you know, on the order of as if I had added a camera on its way back. It's not quite there, but it's it's almost like that if I had added a, a camera on its way back. Um, and we've tested for biases in the data set. It's not like the target to source is any easier than source to target. And we've done second nav source to target, second nav target to source. The results are essentially unchanged. Um, so. Do me so memories definitely contain implicit map-like information because they enable shortcuts. Do these memories contain explicit maps? Can we just decode metric maps? Um, and so let's just try to do that. Let's just take the last hidden state of this LSTM and just feed it into a decoder and supervise against a map. And we can actually decode fairly surprisingly detailed maps. Uh, so dark gray here is uh, free space, uh, light gray here is occupied space, blue is the space that the agent has traveled through. And so notice that it can predict depths of hallways. It can tell that even though it hasn't been there, at some point free space ends. There is a wall somewhere. It has a notion of where the wall must be. It is not always right. For example, it is predicting a wall outside of where, you know, on the left side here as well. But we find essentially that if we measure intersection over union of these maps, uh, an untrained agent memory versus a trained agent memory, um, we can get significantly greater accuracy of decoding explicit maps uh, in the memory of these, in the LSTM representation of these navigation agents that have never seen anything. They're just basing this off of localization. Where are you? How far you've traveled? And finally, uh, what does it forget? Like memory has a capacity. So you have to remember something and you have to forget something. You do not have unbounded memory. Um, and turns out, I won't go into details of this, but the agent forgets excursions. So anytime it was following a path where it came back, that's where we find that the prediction accuracy of this map is low exactly there. So it cannot decode excursions 
it the errors of the decoder decoding decoding of map happened when it when it took a excursion so it's essentially forgetting about that part so it's forgetting about excursions which is what lets it not go through excursion excursion regions on its way back so it's accurate the map decoding is accurate where it needs to be the map map decoding is bad where it doesn't need to be so what have we learned about blind agents we've learned that they can navigate exceptionally well we've learned how that they're navigating is they're clearly remembering they're remembering over 1000 past steps um their memories are containing map like representations that are enabling shortcuts and that we can in a lot of cases with some accuracy non trivial amount of accuracy and significantly greater than than training we can decode explicit metric maps and that the limits of this memory are that it's actually task specific it's forgetting excursions because it does not need to remember excursions um it needs to remember uh how to travel in this these spaces and on its way back therefore that's why it's not that's why it's taking shortcuts because it doesn't remember excursions so where does that leave us um i would say it's time to expand tolman's title uh from 80 years ago to cognitive maps in rats people might as well make it gender neutral at this point and and machines um i'm actually you know fairly fairly convinced by the argument of smith and gasser that intelligence emerges from embodied sensory motor activity when this may be another brick in that wall um i want people to you know people may know this but there's a there's this essay by rich sutton uh called the bitter lesson which is that where he starts off by saying that the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of ai research is that general methods that leverage computation are ultimately the most effective and by a large margin um you can view our work in that light that we we basically made minimal assumptions and we scaled learning um and then we in the second half showed you well what does that discover and it discovers fairly interesting strategies um as a minor sort of philosophical note uh i've been calling this radical empiricism and i this is the kind of thing that for example uh uda paul would object to that uh, empiricism does not uh, give you knowledge that uh, all we can do is come up with with uh, explanatory models and theories and test them in some sense you know we we did the same thing I, i'm calling it radical empiricism but really we used it to go in and test the cognitive map hypothesis so this is like a you know side uh, sort of philosophical point um i'll leave you with these pointers uh, the habitat simulation platform is completely open source uh, we you want to use it for navigation for instruction following for uh, interaction tasks in simulation uh, we we our source code is public is open source uh, it's a fairly liberal license even though it's maintained primarily by engineers that are supported by fair um it's an open source project and the license basically says you can do whatever you want with it including commercial activity um the paper for decentralized ddppo is here and its code base is also available in the habitat uh, paper um and so with that i'll stop and hopefully i've at least managed to convince some of you that we should pay attention to we should take the idea of embodiment seriously thank you thank you drof and this was a really fascinating talk uh i believe you said you had a hard cut off at 12 uh noon and it's noon right now um so i guess we'll have to leave it at this yeah uh i could if it's something quick i can probably go a minute or two over into noon uh and take maybe one question but other than that i likely can't stay okay uh uh does anyone have a a question ah uh, it looks like a uh, harsh uh maheshwari yes that's right thanks uh thank you professor this was a very interesting talk so i had one very uh, uh basic question so you have tried this uh, map thing with the blind blind agents uh, do you plan on trying this with sighted agents but without the gps sensor 
Uh, fascinating. Uh, yes, so that's an interesting natural question. We have tried this with sighted agents with the GPS compass sensor, and we find uh, actually that the quality of maps is slightly worse. Uh, and we suspect that's because, uh, you know, when you can see, uh, you don't need to create those detailed maps. Uh, essentially, like the, the absence of vision places a stress on it where it just has to invent these sort of strategies. When you can see, you can actually spot the holes in the doorways and, and stuff. Um, you were asking about sighted agents without GPS and compass. Uh, I, we haven't tried that yet, uh, but that's, a, that's, an interesting, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Makes sense. All right, thank you, Drav, as well. Um, Amy, could you uh, please stop the recording? And thank you.